Sorry we're late, we've had technical difficulties, but God, for His glory and His glory alone, safe travels, all my family traveling back to different parts of the country in Canada and Australia today and tomorrow. We had a great homecoming for Nolan. Blessings. God is so good. Today I want to talk about costly sacrifice. The title of the message is Costly Sacrifice Suitable for the King of Kings. Amen? I'm going to Read Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a poor widow casting in two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her punery has cast in all the living that she had. Father, this is your word. This is your truth. You are truth. I pray you speak to our hearts. I decree your glory over every hearer. Let your word go forth as you will, Father. Touching, changing, shifting in this last hour. May we have ears to hear. And hearts to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Speak, Father. Your servant hears. So here was Jesus in the temple at a time when the offering was being collected. And he's watching as he always is. He sees everything. And he makes the the remark that there's this one woman and he gave her descriptives she was poor and she was a widow and she's coming to bring her gifts into the treasury and she cast in two mites two mites is a very small amount of money and I didn't look it up and I can't remember exactly how much it is But think of it in terms of, say, a dime compared to dollars. And then there were others who were putting generously in the offering. But I want you to note how Jesus, how the God of the universe, how he looks at the gifts that are given so we have this idea that the more we give that somehow that means that we've got greater reward or it means that we are greater or we're better the more that we give and it makes sense in a worldly logic but God says in Isaiah 55 My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So when he looked at this widow woman, and she's putting two mites in the plate, he says of her, he says of her, that her offering is acceptable. He said, this woman who put this small, tiny, seemingly insignificant amount into 
the treasury that she cast more into the treasury than all these put together who cast their abundance in there. And that's how God looks at gifts. He said, she out of her punery, and that's extreme poverty, destitution. How do we look at it? Well, I've only got a few dollars, and I need these few dollars to do X, Y, and Z. And I can't give that. But she gave it. Because she felt like, I have to put something in the offering that's costly. It says, she cast all the living that she had. Maybe you might think, I can't cast it in because I need money for groceries next week or whatever not. What is it costing you to serve God? I want to ask that question today. What is it costing you to serve the God of the universe? What is it costing you? It costs him all of his life. It costs him priceless blood. It cost him everything. I want you to know that whenever you come before a king, you bring a gift. But not just any gift. You always bring your best. And your best may not be like the best of the majority, but it's your best. Nevertheless, it's costly. It's costly to you. It's significant. What is it costing you to serve the God of the universe? Somehow, in the last few decades, this idea has crept into Christendom that you come to the altar, give your heart to Jesus, and it seems like that's where it ends. No, my sweet, beautiful, beloved brothers and sisters, that's where it begins. It's only the beginning. When you give your heart to the Lord, it's just the beginning. There's so much more. There is a journey. And that journey, though it is free to enter into it, it will cost you everything to walk that journey. And that's something that somehow we've not been told. The, the game is on. The race is on for converts. But there's no way in the Bible where God wants converts. He wants disciples. He wants followers. You see, a convert, when they come in, that's where they stay. So so Jesus is going that way, and they don't follow him. They stay right there. They're in, and that's where they are. But a disciple follows the master wherever he goes wherever he sends them, wherever he takes them. That's what God wants. Disciples, sons and daughters who love him so much, who walk with him intimately, who can look him in the face and see who he is. And by seeing who he is, they begin to understand who's they are who they belong to this master of the universe jehovah yahweh the self-existent one 
who needs nothing and no one to complete him or to make him God. That's the one we serve. Jehovah Gibor, the mighty God. Elohim, Jehovah Bor, our creator. What is it costing you to serve God? Is it going to cost you the admiration of family and friends? Do you choose their admiration because you don't want them to despise you? What is it going to cost you to serve God? Is your sacrifice costly? Is it going to cost you saying no to the flesh? Is it going to cost you saying no to sex outside of the marriage that God ordained? Is it going to cost you to say no to satisfying addictions of the flesh? Is it going to cost you being lonely? Instead of shacking up, running after someone who in the end will cause you to pay a price that you cannot pay. Is it going to cost you forsaking ungodly relationships? What is serving God costing you? Is it going to cost you creature comforts to pay your tithe like this little woman did? Costly sacrifice suitable for the king of kings. What is it going to cost you to serve God? Is it going to cost you giving up what's going to stand in the way of you focusing on each child that God has put in your care so you can steer them in the right direction? Too many parents, too many guardians, too many caretakers put the children in front of a TV or with a game or a, a handheld device because they want to do other things. It's going to cost you to cause that child to turn out in a way where indeed it can be seen that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. They are walking in that path that is right and good. While everyone else is allowing their treasure, your child is a treasure, a reward from God. While everyone else is causing their treasure to just stray and do whatever and get defiled, it's going to cost you to walk that child down the path of Christ. What is it going to cost you to serve God? Is the cost that you are paying a gift fit for a king? Or is it business as usual? Give him my leftovers. Give him my afterthought. You know, like some people, they don't want to wash their clothes or care for it, so they just put it in a bag and Take it to the thrift store. Abominable. What is it going to cost you? Will you take that kind of stuff if somebody just thrusts that at you? A bag of dirty clothes. Will you take that to wear? So why would you give it to somebody else? What? 
is it costing you? One of our problems today is that we don't recognize the King of Kings. We don't recognize him as the King of Kings. We don't understand what it means for him to be the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We have no fear of God anymore. And I want to caution you, one day it will be too late. I want to tell you a story in the Bible with David in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24 we see that God caused a pestilence to come upon Israel and during that pestilence 70,000 men died and the angel of God was about to stretch his hand out upon Jerusalem to destroy it and God his heart just was, the Bible says this word, repented. And God said instead, and, and there's a story behind it that I don't want to get into, where David numbered the people, something that God told him not to do. He numbered the people. And, and and I want to pause and say this. We do that. We do that. What him numbering the people represent. It's fear. We're so fearful of what will happen. What might happen. Instead of trusting the God of the universe. We trust in the arm of flesh. And that's what David did. He numbered how many people were there in the army. So God sent the plague. Well, God gave him a choice of what he wanted as punishment. And the three choices he was given, he decided, the one that I'm going to take is casting myself on the Lord. Because he is merciful. And that's what happened, sure enough. God's mercy kicked in. And God says, this is what I want you to do. He told the prophet, go to David and tell David in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. Go and rear up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jezubite. And so David did what God said, and he went to Aruna. And when Aruna saw the, the earthly king David coming towards him, here's what he did. He went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. That's how you approach a king. You humble yourself before him. We're talking of Aruna, an earth, an earth, bowing to an earthly king, David. But that's how we come, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. We come before God with hearts that are humble, recognizing that he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords. He's also Lord Sabuot, which is the Lord of Heaven's armies. He can snap you with one word, one point of the finger. So you're coming to this king with a heart that understands that in a second your life can be dissolved. So Runa asked, him David you know ask David what is my Lord the King come to his servant I notice there are lowercase L's and lowercase King because he's the earthly King not the capital L Lord of Lords capital K King of Kings and David told him I come to buy the threshing floor from you so I can build an altar 
to the Lord that the plague can be stayed, stopped from the people. And Aruna said, understanding how you approach a king, understanding about giving gifts to kings, Aruna says, take it. Let, it, let, let, let whatever seem good to you, you go ahead and you take it. Here, here is oxen for burnt offering. Here are all the instruments you need. Here's the wood, whatever you need. You go ahead. You take it for free, King David. All these things he gave to David as a king. And he said, the Lord your God accept you. He understood the line of authority. But notice in verse 24, 2 Samuel 24, 24. 2 Samuel 24, 24. The king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it of you at a price and listen to what he said I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God of which does not cost me anything I will offer no burnt offerings to my God which cost me nothing and that's where I want you to hear today we are offering refuse to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Here, Aruna offered King David the threshing floor, his threshing floor. Look up what that means. That's not the point of my message, so I don't want to waste the time talking about the threshing floor, how important it was to that community. But here is this Aruna so recognizing and honoring the earthly king in order to honor the heavenly king that he's saying you take it but not only take that take oxen take part of my livelihood take wood take the threshing instrument whatever you need you take it and may the Lord God accept it and David said no I will not offer to my God anything that costs me nothing. Say that with me. I will offer nothing to my God that costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And there David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stopped. David refused to offer to God. And I remember there was a time, and you can look this story up in the Bible, when David was bringing the ark of the Lord and, and there was a history behind it of 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 death and so much that he was careful how he was off bringing this this ark to the Lord and so he was worshiping God and worshiping it says he was worshiping and dancing so much that he danced out of his clothes that's how passionate he was for his Lord and his wife is looking out the window and she sees and she scorned and she said to him how despicable how despicable that you would shame, be so shameful in front of everyone that you would unrobe in front of everyone how despicable and David said to her I will be despicable when I'm serving my God if that's what you think this is. 
Of course, it cost him his wife, and it cost him children from her because God cursed her for her behavior and stopped her from having children. David was called by God a man after God's own heart. He understood in all his faults, in all his sin, he still understood the cost of the sacrifice to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How about the alabaster box in Luke chapter 7? It said in verse 37, a woman in the city who was a sinner describes any one of us. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of ointment. And you've got to understand about an alabaster box. It's a certain kind of material that helps to keep the ointment pure. And so when you put the ointment in this box, this, this jar, it has to be sealed. And that's how the ointment was preserved, pure. And so it's very costly because once you open that box, then the essence, the purity will begin to escape. So you open the box and then you have to use it. So this alabaster box, who knows how much it costs this woman to purchase it, but that's her best. And she's bringing it to Jesus. And it said she stood at his feet behind him. Behind him. Honoring. Think of it. Here's a sinner woman. Recognizing the master. And that's why she's behind. She's honoring. Humbling herself before him. And what does she begin to do? Wash his feet. She's not up in his face like, hey, look at me. No, she's at, at his feet, washing her feet with her tears and the ointment. And then she's wiping it with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing his feet with ointment an offering that is costly, a costly sacrifice suitable for a king what are you offering him what is it costing you there was also a woman in John chapter 12 Mary and it said she bought a pound of ointment of spikenard and it says it was very costly and she also so thankful so grateful to the master recognizing who he is it, it, it makes me want to weep when I think of how we treat Jesus how we claim we love him how we stand on the altar and sing these songs of worship that give us so much applause and we get so much accolades for how beautifully we execute these songs and the words. And yet, the Lord will look at us and say, Your heart is far from me. What is it costing you? Is it Mary, in John chapter 12, verse 3, took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor. What odor is filling your house? This house, this temple that we live in, and your, your house that you live in, what odor is filling it? And of course, Judas Iscariot complained, why, would this, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence 
and giving to the poor. And I'm saying that to show how costly the ointment was. I want to tell you today, we, we've got to, listen, my beloved sisters and brothers, hear me. We've got to get back to the place where we honor the King of Kings. Where we honor the Lord of Lords. Where the fear of the Lord is back in our hearts, in our home, in our churches, in any institution that has the name Jesus on it. Where we honor His Word, which is who He is, which is who God is. Where we honor His Holy Spirit, who is God, who's with us 24-7 to help us to understand and honor who Christ is through the Word of God. Gifts, suitable for the King of Kings. What is it costing you? In Revelation 4.10, we see the elders, the 4 and 20, the 24 elders, how they fell down before Jesus who sat on the throne and worship him and they said you are worthy O Lord to receive honor sorry to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and for your pleasure they were created And they cast their crowns at his feet. They cast their crowns before the throne. I want to be able, in the end, when I stand before my Lord, to cast at least a crown or two at his feet. That must be our goal, to honor our Lord. To do so, our journey must begin here on earth, not as a convert to Christianity, but as a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Following him on this journey to the end. How do you see, receive crowns that you can cast at his feet in the end? Costly sacrifice. Costly. Listen. Your sacrifice has to be costly. James 1 12. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to them who love him. Listen. Costly sacrifice is to endure temptation, not to give in to it, not to live in it. It's like Joseph when the woman tried to offer herself to him. And I bet she was beautiful. And I bet she smelled good and looked good. But no, he ran. He flee. He refused to give in to that temptation. You get a crown. You receive a crown of life. And you're blessed in this life that you live when we endure temptation, which comes to try us. A good place to read is Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and see how Jesus endured temptation for us. He's our example. 
He endured it. He did it all for us. He's more than our example, but we can walk the walk that he walked as a human being. The next way that we get a crown that we can throw at his feet, 1 Corinthians 9.25, is striving for mastery by being temperate in all things. Every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. Think of Simone Biles and um, all the ones that are in the Olympics. They're doing it. They're striving for mastery. And to do that, they have to live a life that is temperate. It's controlled in so many areas. So their bodies can be fit for whatever that they have to endure to get that crown. Whether it's a race or whether it's gymnastics. We were watching some of it where those women spin that thing round and round and throw it out. The, how about the, the young man who's running the race and in the final lap, as he jumps over that hurdle, falls to the ground, hits his head, and gets knocked out in the final lap. You see him in the hospital bed looking so sad. Yet yeah, you would feel sad if you come that close and lose everything after you fought a good fight. He was fighting for an incorrupt, I'm sorry, for a corruptible crown, one that's going to be destroyed, but we, for an incorruptible crown, one that will not be destroyed. And so we have to be temperate in everything that we do. We can't keep giving in to, to fleshy stuff. The next way that you receive a crown, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, you fight a good fight and you finish the course and you keep the faith. You're walking this walk following Christ. You're knocking away every temptation and every one that you give in to, you get up and you keep going again. You finish the course. You keep the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, who's the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all those who also love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Do you understand that he's coming soon? I did my, the eulogy for my, brother-in-law's funeral yesterday he's gone he is gone he knows whatever's been faced or we'll die or Christ will come for us are we looking for his appearance don't be stripped of your glory either by tripping and falling like that young man did. His wasn't intentional. But it happened. And he lost his crown. Job 19.9 says. He has stripped me of my glory. And taken the crown from my head. You can be stripped of your glory. Don't think. That you can come to the altar. Give your heart to the Lord and then live your life as you please. Don't be fooled. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, 10 to 11, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, give diligence, to make your calling and your election sure, you shall never fall. 
for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly, so hold fast what you have and do not let no man take your crown. Don't let your crown be taken by fleshy pursuits. First Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Listen. No matter what you believe or what you think, I see cars right. God said it, I believe it, and that's it. That's inaccurate. That is inaccurate. It should be instead, God said it, that settles it. Because whether you believe it or not doesn't change what God says, who God is, what God says he will do. So your believing it is not what settles it. What God says settles it. What you believe settles it for you, whether you're going to hell or to heaven. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 10 to 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall, every knee. Those in heaven, those in earth, those under the earth, Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee. So I want to encourage you today. Honor the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Fear the Lord. Honor his word. Honor his Holy Spirit. Give costly sacrifice suitable for the king of kings and the lord of lords gee listen here is the thing that i want you to get i'm not talking works i am not talking works lest any man should boast i am talking i walk with the lord that he fully paid for but not only did he pay, it's like this poor woman with children, this rich man don't know her from Adam and don't want to know her. His heart was just moved not only to buy her a home, but to furnish that home with everything she needs and then to put money in trust to pay for the upkeep of the home. In other words, he made sure that this poor woman was not living poor anymore. And that's what Christ did for us. He paid the price for us to give costly sacrifice. He paid the price for us to do it. He provided it all. He showed us how from the moment he came on the scene, even at 12 years old, it was too soon. Time wasn't ready. That's a whole different subject. But at the moment he was 30, he came to the baptism waters. And from that moment, we see it. We can trace it. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, he comes to the baptism waters. And even though he did not have to repent for sin, he was coming with our sin. He was preparing the way. And that's why he said to John the Baptist, suffer it to be so. This is God's plan. This is God's way. This is how we come. 
We come to repentance. We come to the baptism water. Then the, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, in us. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Here is where we are called. Here unto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. The ESV translation says 1 Peter 2.21 this way, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. We don't like that word. Oh, um, Christ paid the price for us so we, we, we can live a life of, 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 of prosperity, of abundance. Yes, he did. But he also added with persecution. He says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. He says, whoever's left home and land and husband and wife and children, whatever they've left to follow me, will have more in this life and in the life to come with persecution. So we don't want to hear about suffering. We don't want to hear how we got to tell our flesh, no, shut up, sit down. You're not getting that. God says no sex before marriage. I am not doing it. No, I'm not putting that drug in my body. No, I'm not stealing. I'm not lying. No, I'm not loving money so much that I give in to temptation to get it when it's not mine to get at that time. He is our example that we must follow his steps. Let me show you as I come to the end, this example, this one who did it all for us, who paid the price that he didn't have to pay, he didn't deserve to pay, he didn't know the debt, he paid it for us, he took our place. Let me show you the philosophy of this one whose steps we must follow on the journey in order that we can give costly sacrifice suitable for the king of kings jesus said this is the philosophy that we must develop john 4:34 my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work that must be your philosophy if you are a Christian. Because being a Christian means following Christ. And this is where we follow him. My meat is to do the will of God who sent me. What is the will of God for you? Do you know it? You can't finish it if you don't know it. So the first place you've got to come after you've come to repentance, come to the baptism waters, make sure that you know the Holy Spirit is filling you, then you have to find out, now what's my purpose on this earth? What is my meat? How do I achieve this? How do I do the work? How do I finish it? And then we have to have this attitude of heart, which means bowing our knees to God in humility. John chapter 5, verse 19 and 30. John 5, 19 and 30. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of his own. The Son of Man could do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So once God shows you what your meat is, you don't just do it. It's like with me teaching the kids math. 
Okay, here's your meat for today. Today, we're doing order of operation. That's your meat for today. That's your purpose for today. That's the will for today. That's what you're going to follow and finish today and in the days following. As a matter of fact, you cannot do your algebra unless you learn the principles of orders of operation. And so now, I give them an example. I show them the rules. I give them an example. And I say to them, follow me. This is my example. Follow. From today onward, follow this. Five plus two times three. What's that? Five plus two times three. If you say 21, you're doing your own thing. You didn't follow the example. And that's how we live as Christians. We're not following our example. Five plus two times three. The rule is you do multiplication first. In this particular example. I'm not giving you the whole rule just for this example. Five plus, five plus two times three. So it's two times three, which is six. And then you add last. Six and four is ten and three is thirteen. So seven, sorry, five plus two times three. Whoa, whoa, I, I'm mixed up. Five plus two times three. Three, two, five. Yeah, three, two, six. <laughs> and five is 11. So it's not 21. It's 11. And that's what we do. Jesus said in John 5, 19, that he, I can't listen. He says, I can do nothing on my own. I only do what I see the Father do. Whatever I see the Father do, that's what I do. So if he's telling you what your meat is, now look and see how he's doing it. And do it like he's doing it. Stop doing it your own way. That's not a costly sacrifice. That's no sacrifice. That's refuse to do your own thing. Five plus two times three, if you get out of that, 21 or whatever whatever strange number that you get I can't remember the numbers I gave I should have written it down so I can keep looking at it but you have to follow the example multiply then add the next thing he says in John 5:30. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as I hear. And my judgment is just. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. So not only does he only do what he sees the Father do, he follows the Father's example. He says, I don't judge any situation unless I hear what my Father says. My father's judgment. And he says, whatever judgment I make, it's true and just. Because I'm not seeking my own. I'm seeking God's. A lot of times if we seek our own, if I had my way, if I had my way, if I was seeking my own way for a lot of things, I would cast people aside they would cast me aside but it's God's judgment this is our philosophy we find the meat of God we look and see how he's doing it and we follow his example we hear how he's judging and we make those judgments according to what he judges according to what is written down in this word already what the Holy Spirit will reveal. 
that's how we live our life as costly sacrifice worthy of a king. Here's what he wraps it up in John chapter 8 verse 29 by saying, He who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Wow, listen. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. What love. What love to always do what pleases God. To only do what God says to do. To only do it how you see God do it. To only judge by what you hear God say. Wow. What have you been offering the God of the universe? Refuse or a gift worthy of a king? So I want to challenge you as I end the message. Like David says, I will not offer anything to God that cost me nothing. Like the little widow give everything that she's got because she had to bring a gift to God. She understood, listen, she understood what tithing meant. She understood what coming before the king to bring her living meant. She understood that that's where it started. And once she bowed down before God and trusted him, she knew he was going to honor her. He was going to do as he said and provide for her. Honor the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Fear the Lord. Honor his word. Honor his Holy Spirit. And bring a gift suitable for the king. A costly sacrifice suitable for the king of kings. Bow your heads with me. And I want you to think for a second as I end the message. What is the Holy Spirit showing you right now about the sacrifices that you are given? Is it a witchcraft sacrifice given to idols motivated by self and the devil? What kind of sacrifice are you given? So you impregnated that girl, and now she's got a baby for you. So what did you determine that you were going to do? Just go your way and find another girl and get her pregnant? What kind of sacrifice is that worthy of the king? When he gave you a gift, that child is a precious gift from him. And he expects you now to stop whatever and take care of that child. What sacrifices are you bringing to the king? But what about the kids you've got before? What are you doing with your life? What are you teaching them? What sacrifices are you bringing to the kid? What are you telling them? What about your own self? your own life, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. How are you living a life where the king can come and rest in you in purity and honor and glory? Or is there an odor in you that is so foul because of what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're doing behind closed doors? Honor the king of kings. Listen, time is running out. He's warning us, get it together. And it's not as if you have to do it on your own. He's doing it in you, for you, through you, by you. But you've got to cooperate and travel with him. You can't stay there while he's over there. You have to go where he is. And if he goes there, you got to go there. And if he comes here, you got to come here. And if he goes up, you got to go up. And if he goes down, you got to go down. Hey, you've got to follow the king. 
That's what it is. You follow in his steps. You follow in his steps. So if you're sitting there doing your own thing, if you're not doing what you see him do, saying what you hear him say, walking where he is walking, your sacrifice is refuse and it's stink and unacceptable. It's refuse. Amen? God, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see and hearts that are swift. Bless Nolan's family, those 12 precious kids that they climb higher in you. Do better. Bless Israel. Protect them. Especially in the coming days, the ninth of Av. Protect them, God. Keep your hand on them. Keep a hedge around them. And protect my family, my precious ones, my loved ones, my husband, my daughter, my son-in-law, our grandbabies. Bless them, Lord. And I thank you for doing it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I love you, Lydia. I enjoy having your boys with me. It's been a pleasure. Wish you were here. Hi, everybody. Love you, Brother Kingsley. You're a blessing. Been using your, I've been using your prayers to bless other people with. God bless you, Auntie Evelyn, Joy, Norma. God bless you all. I love you much. Next Thursday, we will not be in the sanctuary and the following Sunday because we're I'm going to my college, my my Guyanese college reunion that I graduated from in 1978. This is the first one I'm going to go to in New York. And so we'll be out of the sanctuary. Of course, the messages are fresh and um, I've, I've recorded it Thursday and I'm going to send it out that day at that time um, 9.30 Sunday and 5 o'clock Thursday I'll send the message out it's fresh from heaven fresh from heaven I'll send it out and we'll be back in the sanctuary the following Thursday I think the 22nd God bless you I love you Give a costly sacrifice. Yes, it's going to cost us. Love you. He's worth it. He is worth it.